All right, welcome back to a bonus episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, let me tell you what we're doing right now. We're getting ready to uh, release some of the archive that we found from when we were the sci-fi shenanigans. Uh, we're going to get those up there for for the posts that were brought down. We thought you might enjoy them. Um, and so without further ado, let us uh, let us roll that beautiful... Oh, wait, they're going to sue me. Play it. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. Time for your daily dose of insanity over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions. A place where the sky's the limit, space is a place, and nerds run the world. And without further ado... All right, welcome back to another episode of the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. Today we're doing something a little bit different. I know I say that a lot, but when we started this podcast way back uh, when, we promised you listeners that we would stick to the subject matter near and dear to our hearts, science fiction. We envisioned ourselves interviewing authors, having heated discussions about books that some might charitably call book reviews, and delving into the tech and science that inspired them. However, today we're going to do an interview of an actor who played one of my favorite characters in my favorite franchise. You've probably heard me go on and on about Stargate, but we're doing it again, people. Uh, If the fates are kind, we'll do other interviews like this, focusing on screen adaptations of the genre. Uh, Maybe throw in a few sci-fi movie reviews as well. Uh, Anyway, now that you know what we're going to do today, let's introduce the guest. So today we have Rainbow Sun Franks. So do you go by Franks or Rainbow or Sun, sir? (laughs) I just go by Rainbow, uh, my full name my first name is rainbow sun but only my parents call me that when they're mad at me <laughs> outstanding I, I i get the full name too when the when the uh, parents are mad that's like universal i bet across <laughs> all cultures and genres but so uh rainbow is an actor uh from canada who's and a singer who's known for his role as lieutenant aiden ford in the television show stargate atlantis yeah. however he's more than just his role on the iconic stargate franchise I'm he's in so on- much more <laughs> absolutely yeah. so he was an on-air personality for much music a canadian music video and variety television channel he played the role of dev clark on the listener uh a canadian drama yeah. um and he had a part in Alien vs. Predator Requiem. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, he yeah. formerly produced a hip-hop group known as The Oddities. He still makes music, yeah. which he's passionate about, and is involved in the video game website Console Creatures and a host of other creative mm-hmm. endeavors. So uh, did I get it so all right, sir? Since I I also, yeah, I also uh, designed clothes. Uh, I used to design clothes uh, at, with, for a high-fashion label called Hendrix Row. Uh, from Canada, an amazing label, actually. And uh, and I was on Sesame Street, too. That's sort of sci-fi because there's a bunch of weird alien puppets on there. <laughs> <laughs> but I was And I was on Lost Girl and Defiance and a lot of other cool sort of uh, sci-fi shows as well. Oh, I love Defiance. They, they should have uh, done more with that show. I was right at the end. I was a purple. I was an OMAC at the end. I was supposed to be the next in command, um, but uh, but some crazy lady decided that – Nicole decided that she would uh, kill the leader and then uh, take his power. So, yeah, I was – so I got mad, and then she killed me. It's great. Spoiler alert. The show's been off the air for a while. You should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, uh, did you ever play the video game for that one? No, was there a video game? I didn't even know. Yeah, it was for oh the God. Xbox One. It might have, it might have been PS4 too, but it was a live one. Supposedly, the the intent was it was like an open world thing, and then if you created a, a character and you did enough, uh, you know, you filled whatever secret decoder ring projects that your your character might get an on air like cameo. Not as you the acting it, but just they would write it into the script. And I don't know if that yeah, ever that's happened. Amazing. It's sort of, yeah, but I that think kind they, of thing. I think just they a, fell off the air a little bit earlier than they wanted to. I think. Yeah, it was a great show. It was super fun to do, and such a I, beautiful production. Like the set was amazing. Everything was really great. I loved doing the show. I, I loved watching it. So, but uh, so the second part, dear listener, is how we actually found them. So I was a crazy fanboy for the Stargate franchise since I saw the original movies in theaters way back in '94. Uh, I remember thinking that this would be. Um, 
a universe that a franchise could be born from. And I was, it's, I'm not saying I was psychic or even, not wrong. <laughs> or, or, or even that my present observation was, was, uh, because I was so smart. It was mostly wish fulfillment. Cause I liked it. Uh, when the television <laughs> a- adaptation, uh, Stargate SG one came on around 97. I was too busy with high school sports and girls, you know, the usual, uh, following yeah. high school, there was army and the, the war. So I didn't watch it either. But when I got home and I was recovering, I rediscovered this amazing world and I haven't looked back. I finished watching the entire run of the main series, all 10 seasons, and then dove into Stargate Atlantis. And I was hooked. Uh, one of my favorite characters of the spinoff was Lieutenant Aiden Ford, USMC, which was rainbow. Uh, yeah. after we released episode one, 100 of this podcast, Winder and I knew uh, it was time to pursue some of our dream guests. We felt like we'd established ourselves enough people, so I reached out. I expected to be ignored, but but Rainbow said yes, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm I'm pretty easygoing. You can reach me on social media. I I'm, I don't think I'm shit, so we're good. <laughs> I, I, I like that you that thought guy. I wouldn't respond. I was like, yeah, hey man, what's up? Let's do it. I was of like, course. this dude's too famous. He's not going to say yes. Nah, I'm not. We'll see. We'll, we'll see when I when I get there. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. What does he say? What, is, what does Jody Hyrule say? I want to get famous and rich and act like I don't know nobody. Yeah, that'd be, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so well, before we before we get started, sir, we have we have the religion question we have to ask you: Star Wars, oh. Star Trek, or Firefly? Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Oh boy! Well, I'm I'm easily I will say Star Wars immediately. I'm a, I'm a diehard Star Wars fan. Uh, I have all of my original toys. My family brought me up Star Wars. Uh, it's our Christmas trilogy. We watched the original three. So uh, yeah, Star Wars. But I mean, I'm I'm all around because I'm a TNG guy, like through and through. I've been watching TNG. Uh, this year, I started again and went through it a couple times. And um, Firefly, uh, I think, was probably conceptually maybe one of the greatest sci-fi shows ever and was cut short, obviously. But it, the potential of that and just the concept, like, you know, the, the bare fact of, of, them, of, of him writing in that, that they speak a mix of, like, you know, the Chinese swearing and all that stuff, that it, it was just so logical and beautiful and wonderful and no one had ever thought that. I just thought that was so smart. Everything about that show was great. I, I loved it too. And there's and, a special and Morena. So there's that as well. So yeah, there's a special <laughs> place in hell for the people that canceled that show. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's the story's pretty deep on why, but yeah, 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 yeah there is. I've, I'll agree with you. So, so, uh, what is it that you love about see... this? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I was go ahead. You, you're talking about serenity, the movie, right? Serenity the movie is a, is great too. I thought I'm I'm good with Serenity the movie. In fact, at the beginning, my uh, my big sister Tamara Taylor is in that movie. She plays like the teacher that uh, that opens that whole film. And uh, oh yeah yeah yeah, I did not know that. She's from Bones as well, and a bunch of other cool stuff that's coming out that I can't talk about. <laughs> you could tell us, but then you'd have to kill us. We know yeah, how it yeah, is. Yeah yeah. I don't want to pay the twelve million dollar NDA that Netflix makes you sign. Oh, also, we never failed. We failed to mention that I'm also in uh, Umbrella Academy, which just came out, uh, you know, last year or, or a few months ago on Netflix, and was a, a huge success. Was the number one show in the world for a little while until Game of Thrones decided to release a trailer for season eight and ruin our our legacy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, luckily the Game of Thrones people got really upset, so they might come back. You might be okay. Oh my God, that would be crazy. <laughs> so, so what is it about science fiction as a genre that you love? Oh man, I mean, I I grew up, I like I said, I grew up. My dad raised us on Star Wars, and and my father and sister were both, um, who are both. Well, my father's gone now, but my my father and sister are both. Um, voice actors my sister's one of the biggest voice actors in the world who has been in every single incarnation of the star wars franchise cartoon edition since the beginning she was wow. princess nisa in ewoks and she was someone else in droids and my father was in droids and was uh shaman Dulok in, and a few other cr- uh, creature characters in uh ewoks as well and my sister's continued to do every single one. She's one of the Jedi's and whatever the hell it is. She does so many cartoons. I can't even. Her name's Kree Summer. She's much cooler and uh, better than me in every way. Um, and go check out her IMDb. It's basically a list of everything that you grew up in uh, watching. She's a voice of everything. It's insane, actually. 
It, it belittles you know, my resume tremendously. I, I was looking up for the uh, show notes. You know, we do the show prep, and I was impressed. I was like, I watched that. I didn't realize because when it's a voice actor, you don't always know who's behind the voice. Yeah, and and on all sorts of video games, you know, like I'm a Warcraft, I'm a World of Warcraft player, and and every once in a while, I'll I'll go up to an NPC and and ask a question or look for a quest, and it's like, oh, there's my sister, and I, I call her. I'm like, you have to prep me on this stuff because it freaks me out. <laughs> it's like <laughs> late at late at night, and I've been playing for too long, and all of a sudden, my sister's talking to me, but she's like a, an orc. You know, it doesn't make- <laughs> <laughs> messes with my head. No. I'll say so. What was your first? So, so what do I love? So wait, what do I love about it? I mean, it's everything. I, lo- I love everything about the genre. It's it's uh, our chance to have social commentary in a way that's safe. It's always been that, and I feel like that's a really special thing. Um, whenever there's been political things going on in the world, it's a it's a place to comment. But it's like it's okay for us to say all this or deal with these issues because it's not politics. It's just in space or it's just another world. So it's we get to really deal with problems that we have here on Earth in a different place, but in our hearts, it's the same. Um, I, I love that. I love just the fantasy of it. You know, I, I grew up on on the Henson stuff, on Labyrinth and Dark Crystal. Anything that's fantasy or sci fi, I just think is is a beautiful, wonderful escape for us. And we know that's true because the same thing is being found by people that aren't into traditional sci-fi in the Marvel franchises. It's it's the same feeling they're getting. They're just the people that are like, ah, I don't, I can't deal with sci-fi, you know. But it's the same feeling. We all love that escape, and and I think that's what what I love and we all love about it. I don't know. And that's all I think. Okay. So what was yeah. your first what was your first memory of the franchise? Was it watching the Star Wars with your with your family, or was there something before that? Um. Well, I'm, I grew up, I, I mean, I'm born in 79, so for me, it would have been Star Wars would have been the first thing that I saw. Um, other than that, it was cartoon stuff. You know, it was like, you know, Thundercats and He-Man and stuff like that. So, but that's more like fantasy stuff because um, there's no science in that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say it was definitely Star Wars. Yeah, Star Wars was, was my favorite thing. You know, my dad played Boba Fett in the Christmas special, so he was actually the first voice of Boba Fett before we had even seen Boba Fett. Wow! So yeah. I will, I will say in the ho- uh, holiday special. Yeah, I will say that uh, Thundercats has to count because they did have spaceships floating around. So I mean, okay, there was I'm into that. I, I would I'm call into that. I, I watched that as a kid too, so I'm I'm definitely going to call that one. And he man, yeah. him and I had a falling out back in the day, so. Uh, it's bad. Are you familiar oh, with the no. uh, back at, back, in they, back back when they used to have the one eight hundred number and you actually had to pay for those, you know, to call? There was a commercial that He Man said, "If you call this one eight hundred number no. and ask oh, your parents, no. of course, we'll get to talk to He Man." So I called, and it wasn't him. It was uh, pre recorded. So not only did I get my butt whipped, I didn't even get to talk to He Man. I love that you thought that He Man would just be waiting at the phone. <laughs> 24 hours a day. <laughs> Can you imagine if you're the actor? They're like, great job. Okay, so for the next six months, you're just going to have to sit by this phone. We'll feed you intravenously. It'll be a great time. <laughs> Hasbro. <laughs> so, oh, man. How did your love of the genre of science fiction transition into you acting in it? I, I mean, just by chance. I mean, the fact that I'm a Canadian actor and we're all just scavengers up here trying to trying to live as best we can. Um, I had I hadn't actually. I had, I was in high school and then I f- I finished. I did much music. I went to acting school in LA and I came back and I did much music. I, I uh, that came just out of nowhere and I learned how to uh, be a host live on air and I did that for a few years and then. I went on tour. I got signed to uh, EMI with my band, and we went on tour. And then I said, you know what? I really want to just get back into acting. I had missed it. It had been a few years away and, and a few years since I had gone and trained. And I said, it's time for me to get back into acting. And the first audition I got when I called my agent and said I wanted to get back into it was Stargate. And uh, I had already – uh, obviously been present to its existence from the movie and I hadn't really dipped into SG one. I just knew that MacGyver was on it. And so that I was stoked on that. And, um, and I had watched it on TV, but I, I wasn't following it in any way. And, um, but I knew the franchise and I was stoked to be in anything with star as the first name of it, obviously as a sci-fi fan. And 
uh, that was it. I got the, I don't know if you know the story of my audition. But I it's don't. Super. Okay. So I go in, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, 23 years old. I go into a, a, the audition. There's a bunch of people that look like me and a bunch of people that don't look like me. We go in and then I come out. I hope I did a good job. I get a call back. So I'm like, good. I go back. There's a bunch more people that look like me, but much fewer than before. And do another one. I did about three or four of those. And then they said, it's, you know, it's between you and a couple other guys. And they brought me back. I had no money. Uh, my agent called me and said, I, they, they need you to go back today. So I walked, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> I walked for about an hour and a half to get to the audition. And, uh, cause I had no money for the bus to be honest. And, uh, I, I did the audition. Uh, then they brought me back. They said, go wait outside. Then they started live streaming to Vancouver and Los Angeles and had me do the audition live streaming. And this is back in 2003 or 2004. And so this was like the beginning of sort of, you know, of being able to video chat in that, in that sort of way. And especially sort of conference video chatting. That wasn't really a thing. It had just become a thing. And, um, so we did that and it was super fun. And then they said, go wait outside. We got something new coming for you. They handed me uh, a bunch of pages that Brad Wright had uh, officially written just for this audition. And it was a long story. And I'm lucky that I have a, a damn good memory and I'm pretty quick. And so they gave me about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to learn it and came back and I did it. I left. They said, good job. Okay, we'll get back to you. I left. And by the time I got back, walking another hour and a half back to the studio, I got a call from my agent. They said, you have the job. And then I had 48 hours to basically collect my things and move to Vancouver. So I literally grabbed like a like an old school military duffel, like the long duffels yeah. that I had, which is the exact same bag that I have in uh, the episode Home when you see me leaving to get in a taxi to go to to Atlantis. <laughs> and I grabbed that bag. I stuffed it with a bunch of basketball jerseys and shorts and pants and um, a few pairs of underwear. And I was on my way. And that's all I brought to Vancouver. And 48, and, and 48 hours after that, I was shooting the pilot. Robert Patrick came and picked me up in a car, told me to put on some rap music, and we were going for our first day of shooting. It was extremely intense within uh, you know, 36 hours or something, I was, I went from being at home with no job to being on set with Robert Patrick, which was insanity. Wow. In, in a whole other place I had never been before. Yeah. Wow. That's one way to jump yeah. right in. So that was my, that was my journey. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm gonna, that was my journey. Gonna, so if I look, if I, if in, if in the pilot episode, if in the pilot episode, I look like I'm a little bit bewildered and a little bit flabbergasted. It's because I am, you know. Well, you were a it's cause I you were a lieutenant. They're expected to look that way, so you pulled it off. Perfectly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I was a first lieutenant and moving up, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna say it right here. Lieutenant Ford was one of my favorite characters. I, I believe your uh, your role was criminally underutilized. Um, oh yeah, me too. So one of the things Thank that you. made Stargate. Um, uh, its own brand, what it's a little bit campy. It was fun, right? It didn't take itself too seriously. Yes, yes. And your character was one of them that could balance that and have some of the serious realism that, that people also liked about like Battlestar Galactica. Yes. You're, it was a perfect blend. So I, I felt like um, that was, that was, like you said, it was criminally underutilized. So what was your biggest regret with how your character was used in the show? Um, I mean, I don't have any regrets personally um, about my stuff. I just really thought that there would be more out of it. I, it wasn't up to me. I did my best with the scripts. I think, I think I was trying to do something that at the time no one really got, and it and and people started to get it later, which was I I wanted to curate the sense of every man who was brought to an entirely new place that was unbelievable new technology it's a it's a mythical city that we knew we didn't know existed but thought might and then we found it you know you know it's funny because the way that i displayed that bewilderment and 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 sense of adventure and um and surprise and amazement 
was very different from all the other characters. And that's what I think got lost because um, we were so used to it being matter of fact from other things. So I, I sometimes looked like I was crazy, even though I was the most sane one because, <laughs> because Shepard got in there. He had never seen any of this shit. And he was just like, oh, yeah, cool. This exists. Okay, cool. Let's get to business. It's like, that's not what you do. You'd be like, holy fuck, look at this. Like, we're in Atlantis? We're in, we're in Atlantis? Like, that's insane. So so that's what I tried to commit to was, like, being the young man that that it wasn't, even though he had been there before, it was still an adventure, and it was still really amazing to be there. And I think years later, that's what I've gotten from the fans of the show is that they were like, you know what? You represented us in Atlantis. You represented the all of us that would get there and be like, yeah, we have a job to do and we know how to do that. But in the interim between that job, we can really, really enjoy ourselves and, and really have that sense of bewilderment and, and excitement and adventure. So yeah. well, I, I came at it. So no, no regrets. Plus when I turned into a baddie, then they gave me some stuff to actually work with. I loved it. I was like, yeah, I ate it up. Yeah, I was hoping that would, that would become more of a thing. But so I, I will say that my um, perception was colored that I was in uh, physical rehab recovering from, from my injuries from overseas when I, when I watched it. So your character was like, he gets it. That was, that was yeah. the thing. I really liked that. So, yeah. so we've talked about your biggest regret. You said you don't have any. So what do you feel like was your biggest achievement while portraying this uh, iconic Lieutenant who shockingly never got lost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think my biggest achievement was um, being relatable. I think is is a real achievement, and 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 holding on to that something relatable, a relatable performance, and a relatable character that people don't have to always look up to as a hero, but can also just say like, "Wow, I get where he's coming from," or "I, I feel the same way." Um, I think also. My achievements for me as a young actor then, like I've come so so much farther than I was then now, but looking back, it was like I was really proud of um, when I did lose my position on the show, I was devastated. I went into a very deep, dark depression that's haunted me till today. That was the beginning of uh, the shadows coming coming into me, to be honest. And uh, I was very sad. I didn't know what it was. When I got there, they told me that they – get prepared for six years and get prepared for all this stuff. And then after a year, they're like, yeah, we don't really want you anymore, you know? And they said, we can kill you off or we can develop a, a story arc to let you leave. And so myself and Martin Giro got together and we wrote what is now the, the super Ford or, you know, evil Ford or addict Ford or whatever that you want to call it, that storyline. That's what we did after that. And I was happy. So my biggest achievement I think is, is that I chose to, not give in to the sadness and depression about losing my job and instead used it as a moment where I could write uh, something really good for him and perform something really good and powerful and go out with a fucking bang. And I think I did that. And I'm very proud to this day of my work. Um, you know, after, um, after the siege episodes, when I come back, like run, from runner on when he's, you know, really messed up. And I, I'm still proud of all those episodes today. Um, so I think my biggest achievement for that personally is just, is just getting through that. It was a really dark time for me. I must say really dark time. Okay. So, mm. so what was your favorite episode to record for Stargate Atlantis runner? Runner. R runner. Without a doubt, runner. What was it? Runner was so much fun. Uh, me and Jason Momoa fighting like two or three times, you know. Um, but also the the opening of Lost Boys uh, was really good. I, I, I no one really realizes it, but that that was like a twelve page <laughs> monologue that I had to go through. And it was very stressful, but it was great. The whole story and all this stuff. But just being able to really flex the fact that like I do all my own stunts. I I, I did in season one. I did in season two. Um, and I have every day of my life since. And so I love the, the action that Ford's allowed to do. Um, I love the emotional bipolarism that he was allowed to display. I love the vulnerability that he had um, in every episode from Runner on. Um, but Runner was my favorite because not only was it for me, but also the introduction of Ronan um, and the fact that, you know, we had uh, our, you know, clashing of of ways and of uh, bashing heads in the episode and it was 
cool that it was a literal transition. You know what I mean? From me to him. Uh, Cause Jason essentially took my place. Um, so I, I really love that episode. And there's just like moments like the, the opening where I was, uh, um, where the two scientists are on the planet and they're going, they're going. And then they walk by and then it, the camera pans up on the jib and moves up and you see me watching them the whole time silently in a tree. That was something that um, I created. I basically, I was hyperactive as I am. And so I was climbing everything around me and, and uh, the director was like, hey, do you want to, do you think you can get up there? And I was like, yeah. And so I sort of Jackie Chan shimmied my, <laughs> my way up about, about 20, 20 feet between these two trees. And I just planted my leg and crossed my legs. And I was like, let's shoot. And um, he's like, how long can you stay up there? I was like, I could probably last about, you know, 20 minutes up here. Um, and we did it. And it was great, you know. And so, like, moments like that where it's both a creative collaboration and it's also physical. And I feel like I'm, I'm giving something that's really great. So, like, all those moments were great to me. So, yeah, runner. That's runner. <laughs> Sorry, that's the most long-winded answer. No, but, it's perfectly yeah. okay. So you mentioned uh, yeah. the transition where you were, were hyped up on the Wraith cocktail. So um, yeah. how uncomfortable was that um, that makeup and all that to put on for that? Uh, the prosthetic we got really uh, – originally it was slow and it sucked. But um, by the end, the only thing that was horrible and triggers me till today is the shark eye. And – the problem with that is it was my idea. That's the one that's the one powerful thing I can say that I wrote into the look of the character is like, I want one black eye. And they're like, a black eye. And I was like, no, like, I want like a black shark eye. And they're like, why? I was like, I just, I think it'll be great for the look and the transition. And it makes them creepy. And, uh, you know, it makes them not so trustworthy, which is exactly what we're going for. So, so uh, that was the only thing that sucked about the prosthetic was that shark eye. To this day, I can't wear contacts. And now I wear – I didn't wear glasses then. And then uh, a year after that, I had to – my prescription, you know, I had to start wearing glasses. And uh, to this day, I can't wear contacts because that thing is giant. It's like uh, – you're American, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's like the size of a silver dollar. I was going to say wow. a loony for Canadians. It's about the size of a silver dollar and they sort of fold it, you know, give or take whatever your eye can take. And the guy that does the contacts came in after scanning my, my eyeball. He's like, Oh, good news. He's like, you can take your eyeball is big. It can take the biggest size we have. The only guy I've fitted with this size is Ray Liotta. And I was like, <laughs> at the time I was like, is that a good thing? Like, okay. And it is not a good thing, guys. It is a terrible thing. They bring this fucking eyeball thing and fold it in their fingers, and then they fold it onto your eye, and it just sort of like goes on like a, a, a limp parachute onto your eye. It's horrible. So wow. that's what's bad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what's bad. In an alternate, uh, in an alternate dimension, where you played any other character in the in the Stargate Atlantis series, who McKay. would you play and why? McKay, McKay, McKay. McKay. Screen time, talking fast, obnoxious, horrible. I hate him. I love him. Yes, McKay, all day. I um in in my in my so what David Hewlett does um. As annoying as he is, I love him so much at the same time. Um, it's brilliant. It's really difficult to do that type of work. It's a totally different style of acting. And I didn't know at the time um, how brilliant what he was doing was until I got my job on a show called The Listener, where I played the computer geek, hacker, uh, you know, brains behind the technology and I had to learn how to do exposition. And so when I went into that job, I studied two people. Um, uh, I think his last uh, – fuck, I don't know his first name. But uh, Gruber, I think his last name. The dude from – who plays Reed on Criminal Minds. Uh-huh. I studied him and I studied David Hewlett. And those two characters uh, mixed with myself are where I built the character Dev on The Listener. And if you watch that and you know what I just said, you'll literally see – where, uh, I mean, it, it obviously grows as I make it my own, but in the initial few seasons, you'll see that that's basically where I, I took all of my beautiful work from. Um, David Hewlett really did something special. It, he's so obnoxious, but lovable. And that's really tough to do. He's annoying. Uh, <laughs> the character is annoying. He's not likable. He's, he's, he's pompous. 
he's uh i i didn't take those qualities that's <laughs> that's a david quality but <laughs> I, I i took a more likable version but but he's amazing and the acting is superb and it's really hard to be endearing to the audience when you have to speak about how this piece of technology that doesn't exist or this piece of technology that does exist works for two or three pages. It's very difficult to do as an actor and you have to have a passion behind it and there's a methodology to it. And uh, I, I, I really studied him for that. It's really, really amazing. So yeah, I would be McKay because I now that I have the skill set, give me that, give me that. Yeah. All right. And I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I wouldn't do Beckett because I can't, I can't do an accent like him. <laughs> I don't think anybody can. Yeah, and ta- yeah, Taylor would be that would be putting a hat on a hat for me, but um, <laughs> like for Ford because it's like you know this, it's the same, just female version. Um, yeah. So, all right. Well, we're gonna pause. Yeah, I think we're good. We're gonna pause briefly. Let's pause for a commercial. Let's yeah. pause for a commercial. You know what? I want to pause for a commercial. Can we do that? Let's do that. We're gonna shamelessly right, go for the man. I love it. Let's do it in like seven seconds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, let's do it right now. Right now. Right now. Now. Well, hello, all you beautiful chicks and dudes of all sorts. This is Suave Rob Suarez, the double X daredevil star of Suave Rob's amazing <laughs> saving association. Here with another <laughs> saving tip, totally free from me to you to help you save your <laughs> so you can live to sit another day. Now, back in the day, when dudes were dudes, this one dude, Benchmark Bob, buddy of mine, he had this little accident. He tried frying up an egg when he was totally hammered. So he washed a pan, then didn't dry it, then put a load of butter in it, then turned on the heat. Well, when you do that, chicks and dudes, the water makes the oil go splatso all over your own personal face. And good old Benchmark got his bench marked, if you know what I mean. Like, when he took his apron away from his face, it looked less like a face and more like someone had stepped on a pepperoni pizza. I don't like to think about it. But that goes to show you, you know? Always dry your pans before you put oil in them, man. Especially if you're frying an egg. Want to know where I learned all this gonzo sh- I got it all done up pretty for you in Suave Rob's Double X Daring Do, the first book of Suave Rob's Awesome Adventures by J. Daniel Sawyer. Come share the awesomeness with me, my brothers, because you never know. The ass you save may be your own. All right. Welcome back. Thank you for sticking with us through the commercial. We still have the uh, ever affable Rainbow Sun Franks here, or just Rainbow if you prefer. Uh, and we're I'm alive. alive. He, he didn't die on us. That's all we can no. do. So no. uh, we, we're talking about Stargate still. So if they did a reboot of the show, would you come back? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> when I come back, uh, I'm, a, I'm playing for it again. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd come back if I played for it. And if they paid me what I'm worth now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I no, I'm just that's me being a dick. No, I'm joking. Um I would I would come back for sure. I I literally just did a convention in Chicago and I paid for myself to go because I just wanted to hang out with my friends. I love that group. They are my family. I adore fucking everyone that i met there they're a long time friends and i'm gonna go visit tori in uh, tori higginson who, who, who played weir um in i'm just doing that for the people that don't know and are still listening um i'm gonna go visit her in montreal she's shooting a new show and because she's close enough like these are my friends so yeah i would absolutely love to play in the sandbox with them and i would love to reprise ford now he would be omnipotent <laughs> Yeah. So, oh my God, with what I can do now, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> so, so clearly, you have the nerd cred. So, what was your reaction to seeing your character carried over to the graphic novel set in this universe? Oh my God, I have comics with me in it. It's so crazy. Whenever I see anyone that like uh, any of the artists that do the covers or any of the writers, I'm, they always give me the comics, and I'm so stoked. Like the variants and stuff. Oh my God, it's so crazy to see myself as a, as like a comic character. Like I'm not. Uh, oh. Yeah, uh, I don't. Mm, I have no words. It's superb. The feeling is un. 
unbelievable because I'm such a, I'm a big comic collector. And so to be able to um, just have a book with me in it is insane. I didn't know that they made graphic novels of it though. I don't have any of those. I just have the individual issues. Yeah. They, they can are find them. Composite. Are there co- oh, I need those. Then the next time I'm at a, a convention, I'm going to, I'm going to look for those. Outstanding. And what Dude, we- how crazy is that? Come on. Wait, wait, wait. How cra- you're asking me that, but how crazy you're a nerd. How crazy is that? It, it's amazing. Like, to be able to like, look- yeah, it's insane. The, my only problem is that I never got a fucking action figure. And to this day, it pains me, and I'm mad because they scanned me, and for some reason, they gave multiple fucking action figures to other people, and none to Ford. And Ford would have been a badass action figure. So, so I'm any, mad. I want a toy. So anybody a, listening that has the skills... I want to be a toy, darling. <laughs> so, so anybody <laughs> listening with the 3D skills needs to get on it and, uh, and hook them up. Because 3D well, printing, it could happen now. Someone someone made me a figure because there's all the people that do customs, so there is one. But I'm talking about with fucking packaging and you know and and Sony MGM on the thing. Like I want I want the real deal that I can hang up, you know. Absolutely. But I, I'm but that's not taking away from anyone that's made me a Funko Pop that hasn't been done yet. Uh, that's just a, a cue for anyone who makes those to make a Ford <laughs> Funko Pop. And uh, but someone did make like a custom. They took one of the other bodies. Um, I think they took the shepherd body and repainted uh, his uh, mel- melaninless skin to look like me. And then uh, because he has the same leg holster that Ford had, I think so. Yeah, I had it. I had it first, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what what props did they let you keep at the end of the show? Please let me. They, I, got, they, I got nothing. I got nothing. They I got like- nothing. I'm so bad. I don't even have my chair back. Some dude in fucking like. Arkansas has my fucking chair. Like I got nothing. I'm so mad. I got nothing. And 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 Ford, like Evil Ford, Lost Boy Ford's leather chain mail vest thing is on eBay, but it keeps getting taken down. I keep bidding on it and they won't let me buy it. But I think it's because my my it doesn't say my name as my eBay account. I don't know. I need to message him and be like, hey dude, just give me my give me my stuff. <laughs> I'm so mad. Like it's the one chair back I want is my Star- Stargate Atlantis chair. And the guy who has it, I keep getting people to get at him. And he's like, nah, I still want it now. I still want it. I'm like, it's kind of not yours. Like, I'll pay you what you paid, but it's kind of mine. Like, I should have had dibs. And I'm mad at production for not giving me that shit. You know who got away with everything? It was Jason Momoa. He, he got everything. He just – he stole everything. I'm so in awe of what, <laughs> what he did. He has, like, multiple blasters and, like – He's amazing. I love Jay. God, so, uh, so if you do it again, you know, just to take first and ask questions later. Oh, shit. I, I'm going to take before we wrap. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> They're going to be like, where'd your jacket go? I'm like, I don't know. I need another one. It fell in a river. I don't know street. what happened. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah. uh, so were yeah. the guns that you guys carried, were they prop guns or were they real? Uh, I was always in real, like my P90 is real. My Beretta 92F is real. Uh, the only time I had a prop was if I was doing stunts because they need the, they don't want me to fall on that metal or smash my face. Yeah. Makes sense. Other, other than that, I, I carried real. Um, we did have, it was real, but I had plastic, cl- um, mags in. Okay. Most of the mags were plastic. Okay. It was just sa- safety and stuff, but, um, but I'm I'm trained on multiple weapons, so I was I was good. I was an exception. When I went in and they said I was going to be sort of like the weapon specialist, sort of like you know the dude for it in season one, I went through extensive training, and I had already been an enthusiast of. Gu- I hate guns, but I love guns. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I don't know if that makes sense. Like I love, I love mechanics. I was grow- I grew up building cars and stuff. I love. I love all things mechanical and things that that hu, uh, human and hu woman kind has made. I, I, I'm an enthusiast of all of these things. So I love guns. I hate what they do, but I love them. I think there's nothing more fun than shooting. It's really fun. It's the same as archery. It's super fun. Anything that is hand-eye coordination is fun for us. That's why we love video games. But, you know. But I don't like them. But it but it was great to uh, to shoot all the, the the different guns. And you know, at that time, remember the corner gun? Well, you were there. Shit! Did you ever use the corner gun? No, I was no, just. I mean, I mean, it was just a. Oh, oh shit! You were. Oh god! I'm glad you're still here. I love you for that. Um. Yeah. <laughs> we we worked with some Canadian uh some Canadians when I was in. They were interesting lot. 
We were yeah, we were a little jealous because they got to have the beards. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that is good. That's what I hated about playing a U.S. Marine was having to clean shave every day. It was terrible. Yeah, and then the high and tight because it was a Marine. Could, if it was Army or Navy, you could have gotten away with a little more. They wouldn't let me. They would not let me. I hated every minute of it. Oh God. <laughs> But yeah, we had, we had the corner gun. So I got to shoot. I didn't do it in the show, but because I was doing all the different training, they gave me that the apparatus because you basically just stick the 9mm in, in that and it, it operates it. Um, but it was really cool because at the time that was cutting edge technology that we were hearing about on the news. Um, and because we had the armor and because it was Stargate, we were allowed to have one and it was amazing. It was amazing. Shooting all I, those crazy guns? Oh, man, it's crazy. I, I wasn't high speed enough to get to do all the cool stuff, but uh, <laughs> probably still more than most people, so I'll take it. So uh, yeah, you, yeah. you probably get asked a lot of questions about the, the specific actors you work with. Um, however, I tend not to notice pop culture unless the actor was so bad at their job, it sort of broke my willing suspension to breathe. <laughs> I, I will say... <laughs> that's amazing oh well, God, I, I, that. I watch it to escape yours was the exception uh it was because i was con- I, I was just coming back from iraq and you did such an amazing job portraying that character i actually thought maybe you were one of the veterans because you know they were getting a lot of veterans into yeah. in the various creative arts so i actually looked you up to see if you had served um oh, so I love that. oh my god i love that thank you you know what i did i just i I'm, I'm friends with a lot of people that have served and i'm i'm empathetic to it and i just studied what it is you know i think that's yeah. what it is well, you it's, it and it's just like, thank you. you know it's funny because none of the none of no civilians fucking got it at the beginning but from the beginning um, anyone who was in the armed services fucking got it right away like at conventions early on they were always the ones that came right to me because everyone else seemed bullshit to them and they and i and i really take pride in that that's really lovely so uh, instead of asking about the actors that you worked with, what characters in the franchise were most most fun for you to work off of? Because obviously you're not Aiden Ford, you're, you're Rainbow Franks. And so you were playing yeah. someone else. So as Ra- uh, Aiden Ford, what was the most fun character for you to, to interact with? Well, we can go through them. Name a character and I'll tell so, you what. So what about Ronan Dex? Ronan Dex. So Ronan's fun for me because Jason's a fucking monster. And so me getting to, and I, so I come from lots of fight training and I, and I'm, I'm, when you're named rainbow, you learn how to fight at an early age. (laughs) That's just a fact. If your name's rainbow, you're, you're fighting. So, so I'm, I'm very peaceful dude, but I'm also very scrappy and, um, and I, um, very physical and so being up against Jason was really fun. And there was a lot of times that we got really deep in our fight scenes. We elbowed each other in the face. We were bleeding uh, in the runner fight because it was raining and we couldn't really gauge our um, our distance, you know? Right. So, like, there was time he caught – I caught him with something. He caught me with a punch at times. And the fact that we both were sort of, like, looked at each other and were like, let's – like, everyone's like, oh, my God, are you okay? And we're like, let's fucking roll. Like, it was like, <laughs> let's, let's go. We're good. And, uh, and Jay and I are good – are close. So, um, so that was fun for me. Uh, so he was really fun but very unique. You know, I don't have that with any of the other characters. Um, that was two dudes that have too much testosterone just kind of going at it. He just happens to be a monster, which made me, you know – step my alpha game up a little bit. Um, there's, there's a picture of him with his bodyguards doing a public appearance and he's so much bigger yeah, than that. Those aren't, those aren't bodyguards. No, Come on. It, it looks like I know the picture. It looks like he's in Paris with some little white guys that have suits on. That's all it is. That's well, all the, it is. Those aren't, but he is, a, he, listen, he's a monster, but he wasn't even that big then. Like when, when me and him fought, he wasn't as big as he is now. Now I, I, I will, I'm a bit scared. Like I, we're in a different weight class now. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm 200, I'm 200 pounds, but I think that he's probably a good 240 and that solid 240 is scary. Like uh, I'm not messing with back then. I would have fought him. Now I don't want to, <laughs> now I don't want to fight Jay. Now I know, I know what it is. So, uh, what about, <laughs> uh, what about McKay working with that, against that character? Okay, so David and I are, are are good friends, and we're great. But like, I used to um, he I used to get him really mad when I would you know mess up because I was young or whatever it is, and 
And um, he's also just very like high strung in general. So I loved working with him. McKay was great to work with because we, it would be tit for tat all the time. You know, I would, they would, they would, they, I mean, they wrote it in the story where we were always going back and forth. It was like, you want to play a game of pick on Ford? And so the scene when I have him strung up um, by his legs, but it's a Ronin trap. And I'm like, I didn't do this. And he's like, cut me down, cut me down. I'm like, you shot me. That was so fun to do because I'm a bit of a dick sometimes. And uh, he had had a good season and a half of, of being more powerful than me. And having him having the blood rush to his head for 20 minutes – <laughs> and we and we stretched it for as long as we can go because you know you can go nineteen twenty before you got to pull them down before it gets dangerous. Oh man, I muffed a bunch of takes. I made it hard on that motherfucker. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I'm just I'm just I'm just kidding. I'm so, I'm too nice. But no, I did. I was I, I definitely I definitely fucked with him, and it was really funny. But he knew what was going on. I wasn't like being a full on dick. <laughs> well, it played well for the characters. So it did. It did. That's what we do. So uh, so yeah, McKay's McKay's fun. I love I, I love messing with McKay because he he messes with Ford's. Um, mentality and Ford messes with his fat boy physicality, so it's great. It works. It works. And so, yeah, what a, it's a ba- it's a delicate balance, <laughs> but it works. So, so what about uh, Taylor? How was how was that character? Oh, well, Rachel was immediately like my big sister, and so we really implement that wasn't written, and we really made that a thing. You know, she was the only one that called me Aiden. If you look at the series, oh, it's not that. something that people notice. But, you know, for us, we made a note of it <clears throat> in the entire series. She's the only one. So in Lost Boys, when I drug them all, she goes, Aiden, you should not have done that. And that is a point that that was an actor choice. That was me and her connecting. It's like me and her made it a thing where we had a real connection, you know? Right. Uh, so, so And Rachel's so special to me. So, like, her and I had a very brother sister connection on the show uh and now anyone who didn't read that go back and check it out you'll really see that like uh i'm not as hard with her she's not as hard with me as she is with other people or if she is hard the rigidity is sort of familiar right you know um so that was really special so yeah oh god and i just rachel is just a fucking dream she's just lovely she's beautiful and she's present and she's empathetic and she's soft and she's lovely and she can beat the shit out of you so all you know get a woman who can do both yeah <laughs> so uh, in the last one what about working with shepherd the no you missed one back it baby come on that's right Come on. All right, so what about Beckett, and then we'll go to Shepard. Yes, Beckett is the shit. <laughs> I'm just such good friends with Polly. I call him Polly Walnuts, and uh, yeah, Polly's Polly's unbelievable. So um, yeah, I got. I, I only mentioned that so I could say how much I love Paul. Paul Paul actually was Mike. Uh, I'm going to give him his real props here, which I do to him in person, but I haven't done publicly. Polly coached me for all of the stuff when i was sad i called him and i said i was heartbroken for losing my job and he said he was he said well we're gonna go out with a fucking bang and he i went to his house twice a week pardon me and we worked our scenes my scenes and uh a lot of um the performance of uh, drug addict ford super ford whatever you want to call him is um is is from Polly. Polly gave me a lot of great choices and he also worked me in a way that uh I hadn't for myself and it was and I wouldn't have for myself. So I owe a lot of my performance to Polly. He's really fucking special. I love that man. All right. And my wife's gonna get mad at me for missing Beckett because that was one of her favorite characters. I think it's the yeah, accent she'll, though. She'll get over it. it was the she'll accent though. It. Everybody loves the accent. It's always the accent. It's always there. <laughs> so and then last but not least, how was working uh against Shepard as a as a sort of foil for you? Because he was the opposite of you. It, it, wait, wait, it's a, it's always the accent until you're like North American and you go over there. And then it's the accent for you, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um shepherd you know shepherd was great because shepherd was a, a fa- we we wrote it like me and joe got along swimmingly at the beginning and until now he's been an amazing friend um 
So, you know, that was like, it was funny because I sort of initiated him into the Atlantis project, but then he, after taking the lead, um, became sort of, you know, the big brother to, to me. And so that was great to play off. And a lot of the Ford jokes were, were built off of um, Ford being the straight man to Shepard's joke. Like, you know, the fact that I can't name anything, the fact that he's an idiot and he named it a polo jumper when it's absolutely logically a gate ship. And McKay agrees with me. So <laughs> there's that. I, I, I was but Shep, Shepard. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I absolutely go. agreed with you. <laughs> yeah. The fuck? It's a ship. It goes through the gate. That's it. It's a gate ship, right? It's, it's also a more lot. Like, why are we giving it a cute name? It's a piece of fucking military hardware. Like, well, well, Jesus you have to remember Christ. your character was was a military person, a marine, and, and his was Air Force. Exactly. Exactly. He's Air Force. Uh, not to belittle Air Force, <laughs> but to belittle, but also to belittle Air Force. Don't come at me, Air Force people. You can't fight. Don't fuck with me. But <laughs> you fly planes. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's like yeah. I was like, what are you doing? doing dude what do you mean it's a gate ship there's actually my pinned tweet on my twitter is uh there's a there's a woman who i just met in chicago actually who i like gave the biggest hug to who it was her i didn't know previously that it was hers but her license plate she got a custom frame that says it's a ship and that on the top and then at the bottom it says it goes through the gate and her license plate is g Eight S H I P gate ship, and I was like, <laughs> "Yes, I like that. girl, you get it." So, all right, before we transition to your other sci-fi franchise, we have one more Stargate question for you. So, if they discovered one, would you step through the Stargate? Fuck yes, I'm scared to die. I'm good. I've already. I'm good. I've been. My life has been threatened too many times. I would take the risk. So let's see where that's it goes. a sort of immediate. I, I would. Li- I would literally like. I would just whatever money's in my pocket. I would give to whoever's with me, and I would be like later, <laughs> immediately. So that's, immediately. That's a, a question that yeah. you see in a lot of um, science fiction is is when they have the technology that sort of takes you apart and puts you back together on the other end, like that sort of existential: Am I really me at that point? Um, so that, that yeah. was fun that, that you guys played off that you didn't shy away from that. Um, or at least, no. uh, at least your character and, and, uh, McKay's character didn't. Yes. Well, McKay is ultimate logic. So he has to not shy away. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So, uh, transitioning away from the Stargate though, it breaks my cold dead heart. Uh, let's talk about, it's okay. We can, we, I mean, we can stay as long as you want. <laughs> it's a, it's a warm, it's a warm place. It's a safe place. Warm Stargate, cool Stargate. <laughs> so, uh, you, I don't know. You, Little circle of water. I don't know. I went to, I didn't know I was going there. It's fine. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, you also played in the uh, Alien versus Predator series, the Alien versus Predator Requiem. Oh, Jesus. So, so, what was that yes, like? Um, what was that like? It was. It was super fun. I, I got a call from the brother Strauss um, randomly, and they were like, hey, are you in town? I was like, yeah, I am. And they were like, would you like to come play? We like your, They liked my work, and they were like, would you like to come play on uh, AVP 2? And I was like, well, what happens? They're like, you're going to get shot in the head by a predator. And I said, I'm in. So then from then on, uh, I was in. And that was literally all it was, was like, we just figured it out. And uh, I went in and did the job. It's funny because it was supposed to be one day, but because of how that whole thing was shot, it turned into like 12 days or nine, nine or 12. I can't remember. It was either nine or 12 days of shooting. And it was insane. Um, there was a like an 18-wheeler. And the trailer was open, and it was raining insane in Vancouver at that time. Uh, and so it was halting production a lot. And that's probably why I, why I was there so much for, for a bit of it. But um, in this 18-wheeler, I was walking by, and the lights were on, and it was raining, and the, the doors were up. And when I went in, it was just – I saw these, like, jagged tails. And I was like, what is happening there? And it was filled with aliens. And it was the coolest thing that my nerd brain could have ever seen. It was such a beautiful sight. It was so weird and wonderful. 
And uh, that experience was great. And and the predator, I don't know the dude that played the predator. He's like this English dude. He's eight feet tall. He's kind of a dick to me, but that's fine. I don't need to talk about that. I'll mention it because he was a dick, but that's about it. Um, <laughs> so, but it was uh, it was a fun experience, mostly just because I'm a fan of that um, of that franchise um, of both franchises. But I'm I'm a, I'm a really big predator fan. Um, I'm I'm a big alien fan too. But I'm a big Predator fan. So when they said I was going to like pull a weapon on a Predator, which is basically a death sentence, I was like, I'm in. Let's do this. But it was just a quick roll. I didn't even know what I was doing. Um, yeah, you know, it was just fun. It was just super fun. They handed me the script when I got there. They're like, it's really easy. It's just you're just going to be an idiot. And then I did improv a bunch of the stuff that was in the – that made it to the cut. Like all the stuff where they're like, are you guys stoned? Uh, that was my me and my friend Juan Redinger who's um, – was in <clears throat> narco okay you'll see him playing he's in narco my partner there he's a great actor oh unbelievable actor great director um but this was us sort of being young he hadn't started directing yet and uh it was super fun yeah i mean just to be a part of that franchise it sort of immortalizes you in the culture and that's something that i i love so you mentioned that you did your own stunts for the stargate do you normally do your own stunts I, if they'll let me, I'll do my own stunts. I am shooting a show in New York right now. Um, and I just finished doing my own stunts. They always bring in someone, but I'm like, I I have a history of like, I'm an old break dancer. I'm very physical. I've studied martial arts my whole life. I'm like, I'm like, just let me do it. I understand the insurance, but I'm like, it's going to look better if you don't have to edit and you have my face. Um, so Bam Bam, who is the stunt coordinator on arrow, who's like a, now a legend in Vancouver, and Legends of Tomorrow and all the other shows. Um, him and I got together really well um, on Stargate. And that's where he was like, I get what you are. He was like, I'll let you do all your own stuff. And that was sort of the beginning of it was on Stargate. And um, he was great. Like I did one of the, if not, the, I think it was the first flying arm bar to ever be filmed and actually on TV or film. Um, Cause those type of, that type of fighting wasn't really done yet. Um, so in the episode, I'm going to find it, hold on brotherhood. Um, there's a giant dude. We're in the basement and we're sort of like, you know, held captive and I take him out with a flying arm bar. And that was one of the first times, if not the first time that it had ever been, uh, on film and, uh, a bunch of martial arts websites and stuff, uh, at that time, which was like 2004, um, or 2005, all like put it up they're like holy shit we can't believe we just saw this you know this is a move that has never been done so it was really cool and it was cool to do it yeah, myself you know absolutely. it was rad yeah i always do my own stuff if they'll let me i'll fucking do it as long as something's not exploding in my face if it's just physical if it's beating someone up or getting beat up let's do it i'm down because it's much better and it makes my performance look better you know it's like if you if you can do it why the fuck not I'm going to get old at some point and I won't be able to. So let's so, do it now. Um, we've talked about at the micro level on two of the, the franchises you participated in, but let's, let's go macro. So you've done several shows with aliens. Uh, do you believe they are real? Are aliens out there? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Yes. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh my God, I can't believe you just said this. Okay. Oh God. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. I'm, I'm coughing. I just, water went down the wrong tube. So just give me a second. So I just, I literally today just watched the, the new Bob Lazar documentary on Netflix, which sort of gives empirical fucking proof that he was telling the truth. Um, but I don't need the CIA to raid my house right now. So we'll just skip that real quick. Um, <laughs> I'm very big into quote unquote conspiracy theory that most of it is very true. And there's so much masking that has been going on. And when we get redacted documents, uh, after the 50 years or after the 30 years, it all, you you know, it's like undeniable that all of this stuff is like, Oh, well, wow, that was true. That was true. But they, they sort of seep it in at such a level that where it's acceptable and it sort of goes undetected except by the community. So, yes, I believe it. I believe it all. I don't think we're alone. How could we be? That's absurd to think. It's really stupid. If you have any sort of logic brain and think that 
we are the most advanced people, like humans, our stupid asses, we're dumb as shit. We still fucking kill whales in fucking Iceland or wherever. We're dumb. So it's not Iceland and don't get come at me for that. Um, but like, you know, we're, we're dumb. Um, so we're definitely not the top species in the universe, you know? So, That's so speaking of aliens, uh, and so, acting, yes, I believe so in them. I think all types of crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. It, you said, do I believe in them in real yeah, life? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I was transitioned for you cause, cause you answered and I, I agree. I, I think the odds are, are uh, that, Okay. That they exist. So when you work in in, that, it's just mathematically and logistically stupid. Yeah. So uh, when you work or portray aliens, um, is there a method to how you how you do that? Since it's you know it's a balance. I, I write aliens obviously as a sci fi author, and so you've got to balance what people understand as a base ground base level so they can relate to it, but still making it. Um, different enough that it's like, oh, clearly these are aliens. Now, in acting, obviously, you have some of the props to go with you, but is there like a method for you to do that? I think no matter what, all we know is humanity. So what we do is we try to, as an actor, is try to make humanity slightly misunderstood, okay. right? Because that's otherworldly. When you write, let me ask you the question. When you write, what do you do to as a tool to make it effective? Because would it be the same tool? Do you try to just slightly askew humanity? Because all we know is humanity. We don't, and all we, you know, all you do is good and bad. So it's like they're a good alien, they're a bad alien. You know what I mean? So I, like, what do you do? As I, as I try to work with with as uh, biology as we understand it. So we we tend to operate on the assumption that they have to breathe air uh, at some level, and uh, opposable thumbs would be necessary for for evolution. Um, so if I if I want to make them believable, that's it. Although if you're going for like a, a Star Wars kind that's of vibe, just physicality. I'm talking about emotionally and like you know. So so my trick with the language logistically is I, I I haven't written yet. Although I now I need to. See, you just see me. how you just jumped. See how you just jumped to language. That's not the same. I'm so, talking about men- mentality psychologically. Like here's the question, and and it's random, but like. So, like, all we know is humanity. So, like, all we know is what we know. So anything we can do is what we know. And then we can uh, theorize, and that's that's the upper level, and some of that comes into fruition, and it's real. And it's like, oh, shit, we were real. We, we theorize this, and it's real. But, like, you can't – it's like, um, like what is the uh, – I'm, I'm going to go into uh, – I'm going to sound crazy to people, but, like, I don't really care. I already sound crazy to people. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyone that knows me knows I'm crazy already, so it's fine. But, like – uh, it's the same as like dreaming. Like you can only dream. What is the theory? It's like you can only dream of people that you've seen. Even if you've met them, you can't actually create a face that you've never seen. Right. Right. So the same goes for writing an alien or writing an alien thought pattern. Is there a way of thinking that doesn't exist to humans? So I would just- or can- or is there a level of consciousness that doesn't exist or or, or through theorizing and ideology and anything else, have we are we infinite in our uh, assumptions? Well, I right. I start with the biology because the evolutionary impetus. So uh, humans are essentially pack creatures, right? Uh, there are animals yeah, that aren't. Yeah, you're right. You're right. We're not solitary. You're right. There, I, I may be. I may be, but we are not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, but but as a general rule, we're we're pack creatures, and so so that's an evolutionary yeah. imperative that you would build a culture off of. And so I try to imagine, you know, you start with the biology, and you say, well, well, what was their evolutionary starting point where they went from mammal, animal, whatever, to to sentient creature, and then you take and you just build off of that, and then but they're but they're further along, like. Like they're right. even, and I and I actually I absolutely agree with you because because the further theorization of ascension is to another level of consciousness, which is the pack mentality, but with smarts. So we have the pack mentality, but it dumbs us down. But through ascension of spirituality, it would be the pack mentality as it would be the Borg, yes. essentially. The Borg is basically what I, I assume that either our next level in death is or what alien races have already attained. Do you know what I mean? It's like that pack mentality with purpose. 
It's not the Pac mentality, you know. Yeah, that makes does that sense. Make sense. It does. Does that make sense? It does. So uh, before we get too long, because we we try to keep these episodes at about an hour for for our guests, I will never bow down to your fucking bookmark. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, yeah, the, I'm an oddity. You already said it. So we we try to keep that. If we ever do a uh, a panel, because we we try to not everyone can attend the cons, so we do periodically episodes that are like a, a panel like of several people to, to interact. So like a con from your home, if you would. Uh, and if we ever do want to talk about alien, well, I apologize. I apologize in advance for whatever happens. Though. What I was going to say, if, uh, if we ever do one on aliens, we're definitely going to have to invite you back <laughs> so you can opine. Yes, please, please, please. Yes. I'm going to try not to injure myself before we do this, but yeah. that's always a plus. So we need you around making more, more often. Awesome I'm re I'm re I'm redressing my root, my wounds right now from my previous fall. So, uh, yeah. so, so enough shameless plugging. So what are you reading or watching in the genre of science fiction right now? Well, I do want a shameless plug because I got a lot of shit going on right now. Oh, absolutely. We'll get to that after. Yeah. What am I watching right now? I'm watching queen of the South. Did you ever watch that? I have not. It's about a, a Mexican woman who goes through insane hardships. She's married to a, or, or dating a dude who's a drug dealer. She becomes basically a drug kingpin, international drug kingpin through a series of insane events. It's a fucking great show. I watch that religiously. Um, I'm watching lots of documentaries on aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, um, um, Shit, I, I watch reruns of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um, I'm fuck. What am I watching? Uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> I watch. I watch insane stuff. I, I have no idea. I watch a lot of crazy stuff. It, none of it matters. So the I'm, I'm rewatching Neon Genesis Evangelion for the like, pardon me, like four thousandth time. If you if you like documentaries, you should check out, and they really should sponsor us as often as I mention them. But but you should check out Curiosity yep. Stream. It's like Netflix, but it's all documentaries. My wife calls it um, um, Nerdflix. <laughs> oh, I like Nerdflix. So uh, also also, if you want to go in on Nerdflix and have it be a mostly sci fi and anime genre uh, streaming service. I'm down to help raise money for this and be a part of that because you just said that and it literally triggered. Can you imagine? That would be awesome. I would definitely that's subscribe. Huge. It might be. It might. Fuck that. Own it. So. Hey, everyone that's listening, stop listening for a second. Hey, sidebar, we can make a lot of money off this. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll have to, uh, to, to research the logistics of that. So. Yeah, yeah we'll talk when we're off air. Okay, I'm down with this. I, and I have the people. Yeah. And we're at 105, so let me start plugging. Okay, I'm uh, currently on a show called, well, Umbrella Academy on Netflix. We're in season two. Check it out. But season one's on Netflix. I'm on Jet with two Ts on Cinemax and HBO and International. Carla Gugino, Giancarlo Esposito, Chris Backus, incredible cast. Plus, there's me uh, lending comical bullshit, and it's really funny. And it's a it's a mess between Sopranos and Mission Impossible. It's one of the best shows and the best scripts I've written uh, I've I've read in maybe nine years. I, I read all nine of them in one night. I, I I binge read them. So watch that show, Jet with Two T's. Um, and I'm currently shooting a show for Disney, ABC, Hulu called High Fidelity. Zoe Kravitz is the lead. I'm playing her big brother. It's based off the Nick Hornby novel and the John Cusack film. We have all the writers as consultants. It's magic. It's going to come out. I have no idea when because we're only on episode seven. But I kick ass and everyone kicks ass. And so watch this motherfucker. It's going to be fucking crazy. That's it. There's my plug. I said that was actually. And I'm awesome. <laughs> and modest people. He's very, very modest. Guys, I'm so humble. I don't know. I don't know. Look up humility, but it's me. So, yeah. <laughs> so that was actually going to be my next question was what you're currently working on. So, so perfect. That's it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and a bunch of like short films and I, and I'm producing and doing my own thing and I got a record that I'm building, but like all of that will come out in a clothing line, but don't worry about that right now. Just go watch the shows. Honestly, Jet is out now. It's only on like the third episode. So you have more than enough time to catch up. 
Stream it. If you can't stream it, just download it. I don't give a shit. Just watch it because it's good TV. Really good. It's like Pulp Fiction meets Sopranos. Meets, it's fucking good. Like, I've never said this about something I've worked on because I am i don't really give a shit unless it's really good. And this is really good. Really good. More than a paycheck. It's really good. So watch it. So yeah. we... we- that's you it. mentioned earlier that your sister does a lot of ver- voice work. So speaking as someone, oh my God. someone new to the world of audiobooks, that's sort of my motivation when I'm exercising to get back in shape is, is I listen to books. So have you thought about following her footsteps and narrating some kick-ass sci-fi novels? Well, I will, as I, as I bring gravitas into my voice, um, you were the catalyst earlier today when we were, we were texting with one, with one another, um, to say that would be a, a, a you know a plausible future, and I never even thought of it. And I think it would be really fun for me to to narrate some audio books, and you know, especially since there's a, a Stargate franchise, and I don't think anyone has narrated the Stargate books yet. Uh, no I don't one think from so. the, no one from the cast anyway, and so I think. Uh, being given your lead on this, I think I'm going to go into researching and and contacting the people that write these books and figure out how to um, be the voice of these audio books. I think it would be really fun for me. And, uh, and I think it would be fun for the listeners to have someone that's attached to it, especially since the, apparently in the novels, they brought me back and called me the wolf and I'm actually not dead and I'm back. So let's, fucking do this yeah i love it let's yeah, do they it def- they definitely left it up in the air about what happened to you like they didn't write you off completely which yeah, was smart. Joe, so what was funny was joe malazzi he said i was dead and then me and him talked online and then he he liked me i think a lot more than he did before and then he he re he tweeted like a year later well for maybe a lot <laughs> It was really funny to me. I was like, ah, <laughs> motherfucker. I'm from the street. I don't play that game, but I like him now. It's fine. He said I was alive. We're, we're back good. We're in good graces again. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah, there's yeah. – uh, speaking of someone looking, I know there's you know, there's a handful of narrators being chased by hundreds of authors and thousands of books. So there's definitely room in the market, I think. Absolutely. And I'm also going to uh, convey this to my sister who would be more magic than I at this. And so uh, – I think that's – you've opened up a, a can of worms. You've opened up a can of worms, and they can't be contained anymore, and that's just, just – we're going to go from there. Yeah. <laughs> so so as we bring this to a close, if you could uh, act in any sci-fi franchise, which uh, one and which character would you take that you haven't already acted in? Oh, Jesus. This is going to be some dead air for a second. Hold on. Um. um uh oh fuck what because it's this is this means something to me which is why it takes up i don't know i'm yearning to be a superhero to be honest so i don't know if that's sci-fi or whether it's a different because it's comic genre but like right now in my life i would like to be in like i really wanted to be cloak and cloak and dagger and then they made cloak and dagger and i was like ah, they went super young yeah. Even though he lo- that that nigga looked like he was about thirty or forty, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I would be. I don't know. I don't know. I think something superhero is what I really yearn for right now, to be honest. But if so, not, I mean, I mean, uh, what are your favorite? I mean, I mean, also listen, Picard is coming out. Yes, I would love to be something on Star Trek. I can't imagine how much fun that would be just because of the social commentary of, of Star Trek. Star Trek's always been a, a mirror for sociopolitical issues, and that would be super fun for me. But not Discovery, which is more like the Battlestar to, you know, it's, it's more of like a driven action. It's a hardcore thing. Yeah. Like, I think Picard will be more in the vein of TNG, which is more of a sociopolitical commentary, and I really would love to be a part of that. So, so just for the record, uh, on the show, when we decide, cause we, we promised the listeners would keep it sci-fi. So, you know, when you yeah. play Scrabble, you have to, uh, agree on the dictionary. So for us, we use Amazon as the dictionary and they say superhero is sci-fi. So, so you're, you're in the Perfect. Then, so, then uh, give me some, I'm a Marvel guy. So give me some, 
Give me so, some. There's not much left, but give me some. Well, there's a lot of uh, superhero fiction coming out now, like novels and stuff. So uh, my my son really loves superheroes. So he started reading the uh, the C.C. Akeke. Charles Akeke is uh, he has some some awesome stuff out there. He um, probably one of the smartest guys I've ever met. We interviewed him and I met in uh, met him in Vegas when we went to a, a writing conference. Uh, other than being a midget, the dude's all right. <laughs> He's a midget? No, no, not I really. He's like midgets. super tall. So I, I was just joking oh. him. Like, like he, oh, he's up there. I, like, I love midgets. I'm sorry. You got me so excited. <laughs> Most of the people I follow on Instagram are midgets. So he's. I'm, uh, not, I'm not. I don't even know. You're not supposed to say midget, but I'm just gonna say it. And they they can all come at me because I'll fight them all. I don't care. No, I'm joking. This is so wrong. <laughs> I will though. I will. But, uh, like but, Will Ferrell and Step Brothers. I don't give a shit. No, I'm joking. I'm so joking. My, my son has started reading I don't reading know. It. Do I lose fans? <laughs> no, no, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. So the uh, one I'm of the things... Right when, now, when I'm sorry. I'm... <laughs> when, when you let your kids read stuff. So so with kids, man, mine are, are 10 and 12, and they read a lot higher uh, level than their age. So I have to pre-read anything we let them read to sort of make sure it's age appropriate, even though it's, it's their reading level appropriate. So uh, they're digging right. the CC Akeke stuff. He's, he's pretty good. So, and uh, those what, are, so what is he writing? What, what books is he writing? So he's writing the, um, he writes superheroes. Um, here, I'm going to pull it up. So some of the titles, so I don't butcher it. For what, for what, for Marvel? Or he's for writing indie? his own. He's writing indie stuff. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. So um, he writes the uh, the Pantheon saga and a few other stuff. Um, he's pretty prolific, um, and so he's one of the guys that'll reach out and help uh, help new people coming in as well. Like he's not one of those "it's my club only" kind of dudes, which I really respect. Like he reaches out and helps new people. Right. Um, and so he does the Star Brigade series, which is the one I, I really like. He took with Star Brigade, he took the um, the character that was Sesco Cisco in the uh, Star Wars, and he sort or Star Wars Star Trek. Don't come at me, people. Yeah, um, yeah, of but, course, the captain. Yeah, yeah you're gonna get fucked <laughs> from that. Oh, you're done, dude. Armor your fucking windows. You're done. But he uh, he took that character of like the dad who had who had to be there for his kid, but he was like a uh, yeah. It's 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 moving stuff. Yeah, DS Nine is coming for you. <laughs> so uh, so <laughs> you should check it out, and uh, and who knows, maybe you can narrate his books too. I don't know can, if they're out. There. Oh yeah, can can I can I give you uh can I give you a great comment? Comic that is like an indie comic sure. to get into. Okay, so it's called Kaiju Max. Okay. Do you know Kaiju Max? I've heard of it. Okay. Kaiju Max is by um, Xander Cannon, who I met at a convention a few years ago, who blew my mind with this comic. It's about um, the monsters, like Japanese monsters. So, like the kaiju, like the fucking, like. Godzilla and 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 uh, um, who oh, fuck um, Mothra and you know all all the different monsters of Japan and they basically have an island that is a prison for these monsters when they do bad. So if you can imagine the show Oz with Japanese monsters, nice. That's what this comic is, and you will be able to read it with your kids. Um, I, there may be a bit of swearing, but it's like, it's pretty good. And it's, it's human, you know, it's human and it's weird and it's awesome. And if not read it for yourself, it's so good. I, I can't promote this comic enough. I think it's really, really fun. It's called Kaiju Max, uh, K A I J U M A X. I believe. Kaiju and Max, I'll throw so. all of that in the show notes, dear listener. And, uh, as, as, a Kids, the Brother. kids have a infantry sar- former infantry sergeant for a father, so I, I imagine it's not going to be worse than they've heard already. <laughs> oh, geez, no, no, they're good. They're good. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> Especially an infantry sergeant, they're good. So, uh, speaking yeah, of uh, of science fiction, so if you could command any ship in any universe, uh, which one would it be? Oh, geez, Enterprise. Wow. Okay. I, I like. Why not? I mean, uh, listen. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, Enterprise. I was going to say Millennium Falcon, but no, it's Enterprise. It's Enterprise. I get it. I mean, that's the, it's the biggest. Why wouldn't I, I, I shoot for, I want to star on the fucking Hollywood Walk of Fame. I'm going for the Enterprise. That's the sci-fi, that's a sci-fi, sci, that's a sci-fi, that's a sci-fi, sci-fi, uh, Walk of Fame. That's it. 
That's the shit. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I always love the uh, the Daedalus class. What would you the do? Daedalus, what would you the Daedalus do? class battle cruiser. Oh, Jesus. No, the, seriously. It's a more powerful ship, but it's not more iconic. But but uh, I, I'm thinking as someone who served, I'm like, dude, I mean, you could kick some ass with that. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. But I mean, okay, fuck it then. You know what? I want a puddle jumper. <laughs> and by that, I mean a gate ship. <laughs> I want a gig ship. I'm going to be captain. I already stole one, so that's my shit. Oh, yeah. Fuck it. I don't give a fuck. I'll, I'll putz around and shoot you like I'm, sh- like I'm shooting a 22 at you from long range. <laughs> all right. All right. And, and <laughs> so finally, the last question. Uh, you played the Marine Ground yeah. Pounder, so, so we're going to ask you, uh, which Space Marine unit from any sci-fi franchise would you like to portray on the, uh, on the big screen? Space Marine? Um, oh geez, what's the uh, what's the thing? Uh, super trooper? No, uh, what is the thing where they where they the space troopers? What is it? Oh fuck, I'm losing it. I don't Starship have trooper. It. What is it? The where they fight? Starship troopers. That's it. That's what I'll do. Starship troopers. Let me fight some big uh, exoskeletons that don't logistically and uh, biologically make sense because they couldn't carry that weight, but it's fun. <laughs> You've got the attitude yeah, you, to pull off like the, uh, the Warhammer stuff, like the because that's just oh, so crazy shit. out there. Yeah. That's like uh, Space Marine on uh, without the Ritalin. Yeah, but I need the Ritalin because, as you've heard from this entire interview, I'm severely ADHD. <laughs> so, all, yeah, all good. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I, before we wrap this up, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just, I was just, again just furthering my cause on how much I need Ritalin, so it doesn't matter. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> so how can listeners find you um don't find me i suck no i'm joking um on instagram is the best uh at rainbow sun it's simple at rainbow sun and it'll be in the show notes. and that's the way to find me because that's where i'm most active uh on my story i'm sort of known for having legendary stories i treat it sort of like a, a short film mixed with a curation of wild videos and i promise you'll love it you'll be intrigued it'll be a mystery it'll be elusive it'll be stupid and you'll also want to jerk off to it so it's perfect (laughs) all right and you can find us dear listener at our website which is www.sfshenanigans.com our twitter at sfs underscore show our email podcast at sfshenanigans.com and our facebook group facebook.com backslash groups backslash sf shenanigans and also what i've heard is there's a sort of like a mythological thing that if you just yell sci-fi shenanigans loud enough uh an hud appears in front of your face and you can just watch uh him live in his house it's super weird true story (laughs) (laughs) my obscure enough for this yeah i'm good all right yeah Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Chris Winder and Seska Smalls, I'm J.R. Hanley, and this was the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of space and all things that go boom. All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that uh, archived episode that was in the uh, in the digital memory hole that we found. We thought you'd enjoy it. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the archive for the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back at our regular scheduled time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.